Chapter 6, Nora. It's taken me decades to get famous and only a few weeks to learn that fame is a dangerous game. It's a double-edged sword with the power to shape and corrupt the mind. It also promises success and glimmering cups overflowing with adoration. Even with the knowledge of its intoxicating and alluring nature, I lift the cup to my lips. But I don't just sip. I gulp like I've thirsted since before I can remember. Celebrating before your performance? Samuel teases from the seat across from me. My finger traces the rim of my martini glass. In just two weeks, Mendax is back on top with record numbers. I think that calls for drinks no matter the time of day. Samuel's black eyes study me. I just want to make sure that you're sharp tonight. These talk show hosts can be your best friends or worst enemies. He leans forward, resting his elbows on his knees. His pinstriped suit is perfectly tailored to his body, hardly wrinkling as he adjusts his posture. You've impressed me a lot in the time I've known you. Young, ambitious, a career woman above all. I hide my smile behind my martini glass. When you're dealing with men of Samuel's stature, it's crucial to never let them know what you're thinking, not for a second. Men can tailor their responses to emotion, but I thrive on emotion. Being aware of this is one of the strongest cards I've been dealt. Therefore, I keep it closest to my chest. Samuel leans back, the flickering lights casting shadows across his face as our car makes its way to Times Square. Do you plan to have kids someday? His question makes me cringe. Never, I answer, suppressing the thought of having children with all my strength. Why not? I set my empty glass in one of the cup holders lining the side of the Escalade. Bringing a child into this broken world just seems cruel and selfish. Plus, this planet already has far too many people living on it. I glance out the window at the passing traffic, then back at Samuel. Why do you ask? Samuel lightly pulls at the loose skin on his neck, inspiring me to take my skincare regimen much more seriously. I find it sad to see a successful man like Samuel losing his battle against age. I can't help but wonder if he's always been this ugly. Maybe he was so ugly growing up, he had to make up for it with wealth and power. If that's the case, he must have been one ugly kid. I respect him for that because I can't imagine what I would do without my looks. I ask people I work closely with if they want kids someday because if they say yes, it suggests they aren't willing to put their calling first. He leans forward and I smell prescription pills on his breath, the same pills probably keeping him alive. I'll let you in on a secret, Nora. When you reach a certain level of power in this world, you receive a calling. It's crucial you understand that once you accept your calling, there's no turning back. The world's favor will bend in your favor. You'll be forced to put yourself above all else, including a family. Believe me when I say that you've been called. You're what Mendax needs right now. No matter how hard I try, I can't force back my smile. Since I was a child, I seeked recognition. At one point, I would have sacrificed my tongue for a taste of fame, and now here I am, finally being called to it. From hearing Death's Whisper for the first time to agreeing to do its bidding after Greater Good's pilot episode, I've grown fond of my calling. It's nice to know Samuel is aware of it and can guide me every step of the way. And it's funny that you mentioned the status of the world. You're right. I'm right about it being broken? I ask. You're right about there being too many people in it, Samuel says casually as the Escalade comes to a stop. If we can't get rid of them, we'll control them. And if we can't control them, we'll distract them with our narrative. All for our own gain. That's the second time he's mentioned a narrative since we first met. Before I can ask him to elaborate, the door to my right opens and I'm consumed by a wave of cheers and shouts. Flashing lights from cameras and phones blind me as I'm guided from the car onto a narrow walkway. Both sides of the walkway are bordered by hands reaching toward me. Two security guards pave the way, serving as barriers to keep me from being swarmed by my admirers. It's not news that Greater Good has grown exponentially popular over the past few weeks. I've been featured in magazines and recognized on the street a handful of times, but this is a level of fame I never thought I could achieve. Not too long ago, the secretaries wouldn't bat an eye when I entered the room. I was a nobody, and now they don't just know my name, they shout my name. Nora! 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 Fame makes the air easier to breathe. The colors around me become more vibrant. Now, this I can get used to. This isn't just the praise I've been looking for. It's the praise I deserve. I look back for Samuel, but he's nowhere to be found. Back on the street, a security guard shuts the car door. Within seconds, it leaves with Samuel still inside. 
A heavy hand forces me toward the entrance of the TV studio. It takes craning my neck back just to see the neon letters illuminating the sign I walk under. The Night Show with Danny Davis, featuring Nora Fictus, the creator of Greater Good. The second I'm inside the building, the crowd is muted by the heavy doors shutting behind me. Crew members and producers overlap one another, making final arrangements before the talk show airs. Screens are sporadically displayed, each portraying a still image of Danny Davis, the show's host. Danny Davis has one of the hottest talk shows on television. The man is charisma in human form, with cheekbones sharper than glass and a hairline so thick it might as well be drawn above his wrinkleless forehead. Not to mention, he knows how to work the crowd and dominate a TV set. I don't watch talk shows often, at least not until Samuel told me it would benefit the network if I spoke on its behalf. Since the moment he told me this had to happen, I've studied talk show hosts and their guests alike. I studied their mannerisms and how they used or didn't use their hands when speaking. I took note of how often they made the audience want to laugh or cry. I adopted their charisma while preparing myself for the host's scrutiny. Despite my underlying jealousy toward Dorothy for hosting Greater Good, I even asked for her help to prepare for tonight. She was more than willing to give me advice, which I found surprising. We're supposed to be competitors, given we're both charismatic and beautiful women seeking the limelight in the same industry. Women like us are a dime a dozen, so I found it best to keep to myself up until this point. Lucky for me, The Night Show with Danny Davis is a production put on by a network Mendax owns. These people, Danny included, are on my side, and if they aren't, Samuel will pour his wrath upon them. The media runs the world, and Mendax is the media, I remember Samuel saying. With Mendax's name at my disposal and death's divine intervention working in my favor, I'm invincible. A showrunner gestures for me to follow him down a narrow hall. I obey, taking note of the celebrity portraits lining the walls as we walk. From famous movie stars to billionaire entrepreneurs, Danny Davis has interviewed them all, making or breaking them on the same stage I'll soon take for my own. The showrunner faces me and lifts his arm toward an open door. Right this way, Miss Fictus. Before entering the room, I smirk at the man the same way I've rehearsed repeatedly in front of my bathroom mirror. I struggle to keep from marveling at the golden plaque on the door that reads, Nora Fictus. Welcome to your own personal green room. Uh, the bar lining the left wall is for you, so help yourself. Feel free to relax on any of the couches. In the meantime, the hair and makeup team will be here shortly, the showrunner says. He points to the digital clock mounted on the wall behind me. I'll be back at 6.50 p.m. to escort you to the stage. I subtly flip my hair while turning back to him, something Dorothy suggested I do. I remember her reason being spoken as though she's a master in seduction. When you flip your hair, you're bringing your attention to your neck, which is one of the most stimulating parts of the body, Dorothy explained. Men subconsciously know this, and while most aren't aware of it, drawing their attention to your neck will increase their attraction toward you. With my eyes locked on the crew member, I smile, exuding an abundance of charm as I say, Thank you, my voice a river of silk. He blushes, then trips over his words. Th thank you. I, I mean, I'm- you're, you're welcome. He shakes his head in dismay while shutting the door. I laugh under my breath while tucking a few strands of hair behind my ear. My confidence has grown in accordance with our viewership. I'm learning to leverage my looks, finding it easier to connect with others and mold them into whatever I want them to be, which is beneath me. My eyes pan around the green room. I instinctively compare it to the one we use to prepare our contestants for greater good. This room is smaller, but it does the job. It's still spacious, adorned with muted color tones. The soothing ambiance is complemented by the dimmed lights shining upon plush couches and armchairs. My phone vibrates and I look down to see a text from Ryan. The text reads, Can we talk later? Things have been a bit off since the first episode aired. I shake my head, forcing myself to focus on tonight's show. Without reading too much into Ryan's text, I set my phone face down on the coffee table. I sit at the couch's edge, placing my hands on my knees. With my eyes closed, I lower my chin and lend my ear to the whisper that grows louder by the day. As if on my command, the eerie stillness hangs heavy in the room. It enters the room, not in physical form, but as an omnipresent spirit. Death's spectral fingers, long and twisted, comfort me with their embrace. With each breath, I draw upon death's essence, tapping into its profound wisdom. While I don't know why death has chosen me to do its bidding, I continue to seek clarity. The fame, the success. I whisper, eyes still closed. Why me? Why greater good? The weight of death lingers, warming my neck and shoulders. I find its embrace comforting, yet I can't help but want answers. Why has death chosen me to do its bidding? 
While I don't hear words, death makes it clear in thought that soon I'll know why I've been called. For now, I must stay the course. Eyes, chin, shoulders. My posture follows the demand of my thoughts. I feel the comfort of death's hand on my shoulder, instilling an unfathomable amount of confidence within. A sort of confidence that's not of this world. It transcends my mortal existence, pulling me closer to the vast unknown that lies beyond. Hi, Nora! A woman's voice greets from the doorway. We're here to help prep you for your show. I've been expecting you, I reply smoothly, standing to my feet. The hair and makeup team funnel in one after another, each referring to my physical appearance as if I'm not in the room. My goodness, her skin is so pale. When is the last time she's seen the sun? One says. The other pinches at my blouse. Keep her away from the dark tones. What about orange? It'll make the green in her eyes pop. They sit me in the back corner of the room where a vanity station has been built into the wall. At first, I'm insulted by their remarks, but when they lift a pastel orange dress behind me and my eyes somehow become even greener through my reflection, everything they have said is justified. They're professionals, experts in their craft. A sense of comfort washes over me, and I feel death's calming presence reassuring me that I'm on the right path. While I've never been considered talent before, sitting in this chair feels right. It's as if this is where I'm destined to be. Maybe not in the past, maybe not in the future, but here and now. I'm being used for something greater than myself, and I welcome my fate with open arms. The mirror before me stretches tall and wide, portraying a version of me that grows more alluring by the second. My bright green eyes are sharpened by a thick layer of mascara that complements my freshly plucked brows. I purse my lips as a thin layer of highlighter is applied to the tops of my cheekbones. Your complexion could cut glass, Nora. One of the team members whispers against my ear. I straighten my posture as a response, feeding on their admiration. Bullshit, I reply playfully, though he's right. When I step out of the fitting room, everyone gawks in my direction. Their jaws hang low, eyes fixated on my face, then down the curve of my waist into my heels. They clap, and it's not until I see myself in a hallway mirror that I realize what I'm capable of, which is surprising myself. I recognize the woman in the mirror, but she possesses something that surpasses human attraction. I know it, and soon the world will know it too. Once I'm escorted from the green room to backstage, I feel a warm hand caress my shoulder. I turn to see the show host, Danny Davis. I can smell the booze on his breath as he whispers, Are you ready to go deep? Danny's skin is glowing, his freshly trimmed beard accentuating his defined jawline. His physical appearance suggests that he was made in a lab sculpted by the gods, but I knew the second he opened his mouth that this man is a victim of his vices. I live in the deep. I whisper back, giving Danny just a bit of what he wants, some attention before it's all on me. We're live in five, a voice shouts from nearby. Danny turns away from me to do a small bump of cocaine. He wipes at his nose, then subtly offers me his coke vial with a smirk on his pretty face. It helps bring the energy. I have more energy than you can handle, I say sadistically. I don't need a drug, I am the drug. He straightens his posture, shaking his shoulders loose. I know you're a big shot behind the camera, Nora, he whispers to me while looking across the stage. It's my job to make you a big shot in front of the camera. His words make me wet. Danny continues, just know if you make me look good out there tonight, I'll see to it that you're adored both behind and in front of the camera. He lifts his chin, eyeing me with a cheeky grin. I'm so fixated on his cunning expression, it takes me a second to realize his hand is palming my ass. He gives it a light slap. Break a leg, he adds before running out on stage. Ryan is the only man I've ever let touch me the way Danny just did. Yet, I don't seem to mind Danny doing it without my permission after hearing what he just said. I can't see the audience, but their applause shakes the building as Danny takes the stage. I close my eyes, and without having to ask this time, Death wraps me in its embrace, preparing me to do its bidding. I need to sell the world on greater good. And in order to sell the world on greater good, I'll need to sell myself. The Night Show with Danny Davis, featuring Nora Fictus. Nora Fictus walks out on stage to a roaring applause. Her orange dress pops against Danny Davis' black suit as they embrace each other. Nora Fictus lifts her hand, her charisma radiating throughout the studio. She sits gracefully on a deep red velvet couch. Danny Davis sits in the velvet chair positioned near the couch. The two angle toward the live studio audience. Danny Davis extends an open palm toward Nora Fictus, urging the crowd to admire her beauty. Look at her! Wow! 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 Alright, let's settle down. 
What a pleasure it is for you to come see me, Nora. Truly, what a pleasure it is. Oh, please, Danny. The pleasure is all mine. The crowd's applause fades as Danny Davis and Nora Fictus get settled in their seats. Okay, okay. Before we begin, I have to hear you say the infamous opening line. I know Dorothy usually says it, but I want to hear the creator of the show say it out loud and in the flesh. Will you say Greater Good's opening line for us? Oh, I don't know. Who wants to hear Nora say the line? The crowd roars in support of Nora Fictus. Okay, okay, how about this? How about we all say it together? The crowd cheers, then goes silent as Nora Fictus raises her hand, holding up three fingers. Ready? Three, two, one. Death, Death is, is in the, the building. building. All right, now we can dive into it. Nora, talk to us. What inspired you to create one of the most impactful TV shows of our generation? You won't believe it, but it was actually inspired by death itself. Please, tell us more. Well, I feel like death is misunderstood. It's pushed away rather than embraced. It's neglected rather than celebrated. The idea behind Greater Good came to me as a sudden thought, like a voice in my head, a whisper. I knew in that moment, the hurt people of this world needed a reward in return for all their hurt, which is why I created Greater Good. We're giving everything to those with nothing to live for. Danny Davis and the audience clap for Nora Fictus. Incredible. What a powerful message working through such a powerful woman. So Greater Good is known for being the show for the morbidly curious. Have you always considered yourself to be morbidly curious? Oh, absolutely. I'll tell you all a little bit about myself. I grew up a mountain girl, always hunting game with dad. We set out in the early mornings before the sun would rise. It was out in the woods where I learned all about the cycles of life and death and how to embrace the responsibility of participating in the dance between the two. Every hunt was a chance to witness the relentless pursuit of survival where I saw death at work. It was in those moments that my morbid curiosity began. Then I got into the entertainment business where my thriller shows took off because of how I portrayed death and now here we are. Wow, given your beauty and charm, I never would have thought that a woman like me could get her hands dirty. Oh Danny, I could teach you a thing or two about getting your hands dirty. Getting dirty with you? You don't have to ask me twice. Crowd buzzes with excitement and amusement, picking up on Danny Davis and Nora Fictus's flirtatious banter. I'm sure the crowd is dying to know. Do you have a special someone behind the scenes? You expect me to give myself away without making you work for it? <laughs> I need to know if I have a chance. Nora Fictus is single and she always will be. But you can flirt all you want. I find it cute. No, but on a serious note, people in my position put their calling first. I'm an entertainer forever and always. So don't get any ideas, Danny. Man, I feel bad for the man who thinks he can pull you away from your calling. However, I will say that I'm still willing to take my chances. I'm flattered, but no man will ever pull me away from greater good. My show is more than just any show. It's my destiny, my answer to the call. I would give my life for greater good. Crowd erupts, giving Nora Fictus a standing ovation. I slammed my front door behind me, feeling on top of the world. From the moment I stepped on stage with Danny tonight, I was perfect. I carried myself with poise, confidence, charm, and just the right amount of mystery. Whether prompted to or not, the audience's applause validated my beliefs in myself. They strengthened my worth. Tonight marks the beginning of a new dynasty that consists of me becoming more than just the mastermind behind the screen. I've officially proven that I'm worthy of becoming the face of my own show. My phone vibrates and I look down to see a text from Dorothy. The text from Dorothy reads, Killed it. Proud of you. XX. A bad taste lingers on my tongue when I read the text. It would be a lot easier to hate Dorothy if she wasn't so damn nice. I reluctantly thank her for her help. I lift my chin, waiting for Ryan to praise me for my living room couch. He's in a black t-shirt that stretches over his muscular arms. The only lights in the room are the ones emitted from the TV screen. He slowly raises the remote, pausing the TV. Did you mean what you said? He asks. During which part? I set my purse on the kitchen counter and slowly enter the living room. Ryan raises the remote again, rewinding tonight's episode to a specific moment. He presses play, and I watch myself speak on Danny's show. Nora Fictus is single, and she always will be, but you can flirt all you want. I find it cute. No, but on a serious note, people in my position put their calling first. 
I'm an entertainer and I always will be. Ryan says something, but I don't hear him. I'm too fixated on the side of myself on the screen. The world around me becomes null as I'm entranced by my own beauty. The way the camera captures my striking features, my aura. The way Danny and the crowd absorb each and every word I speak. I think I'm in love. Nora? Ryan's voice pulls me from my trance. It suddenly dawns on me that I'm sitting beside him on the couch. Did you hear what I said? No, because it doesn't fucking matter. I'm on TV. I lightly drag my nail down his chest. Oh, I'm just playing the part, I assure him smoothly. The crowd wants to see a hardworking woman win. I'm giving them what they want. Ryan's thumb grazes my naked shoulder, his eyes on my lips. Right, but what do you want? I want more. More fame, more power. It's only been a few weeks and I'm already more famous and more powerful than I ever could have fathomed. And yet, I want more. I want you, I lie, merely saying what he wants to hear. The two of us stare at each other's lips. We don't need to get too deep into what I said on the show tonight. It's not just what you said, Nora. It's the way you said it. It's the way you carry yourself now, Ryan says softly. Ever since you started Greater Good, something has been different about you. Don't worry about me. I gently trace his full lips with my thumb, then whisper, I said I want you. All of you. I flip my hair, exposing my neck. Ryan caves on cue, his lips molding to mine, our tongues sweeping each other's lips and sounds escaping us without our control. His pecs tighten around me as he reaches around my back for my dress's zipper. Just halfway down, the zipper catches, but Ryan tears through it anyway. He can't wait, and neither can I. I whine as he lifts me onto his lap, one leg on each side of his waist. He palms the small of my bare back while the other forces my lips to his. I think I'm obsessed with you, he breathes into me. I'm obsessed with me too. Warmth grows between our legs, and I draw a quick breath when I feel him growing hard against me. With my arms around his neck, I drag my body over his and whisper, I want it. How do you want it? From behind. I exhale between moans. Bend me over the table. In one swift motion, Ryan turns me over the coffee table. I spread my arms over the table, sending a glass shattering over the hardwood floor. I feel Ryan yank my thong down to my knees. A whimper escapes my lips when I feel the length of him slowly make its way inside me. I bite my lip to keep from shouting as he grips the curve of my waist with one hand and my hair with the other. Ryan pulls my hair, lifting my chin, and that's when my eyes lock on the screen. I taste Ryan. I smell Ryan. I hear Ryan. I feel Ryan but I see myself on the TV screen, and I come quicker than I ever thought I could. It's my birthday on Monday, Ryan says as he makes his way to the front door of my apartment. My parents wanted to take me out, but I told them I might have other plans. He raises a brow. Am I crazy for wanting to take you out to dinner for my own birthday? I laugh while opening the door. With the side of my head pressed against the door frame, I mutter, no dates, remember? We set boundaries for a reason. He rolls his eyes, stepping into the hall. All I want for my birthday is to cross just one boundary. Nora, it's one date. Just dinner, you and me. I'll even make the reservation. All you have to do is show up. It's Monday night. You know we're filming the next episode. You've already done so much for Mendax, and you've been working overtime. Roth will let you take one night off. I bite my lip, then exhale. <sighs> one date. Only because it's your birthday. But you have to make the reservation and we meet there. Ryan throws a celebratory fist in the air, then leans against the doorframe. I always knew you had a heart, Nora Bennett, he teases. I struggle to hide my smile. Don't push your luck. <laughs>